November of 69, went back to Minneapolis and um, then we started what they called the AIM Patrol in, in Minneapolis. And they would collect information of police brutality, of taking pictures of them and see if we can get their... Uh, we had like um, they were about 15 teams out almost every weekend. And that's when the brutality and the beatings would happen, and all the arrests. And so we got a lot of pictures of people being on the streets and police coming down. And, and we showed uh, in the first weekend to the chief of police that there was brutality there. And he said, well, he said, well, I can't argue with these pictures. So he, uh, there was about 10 police officers were put on leave with pay. Um, and, uh, but we took some of the, the police officers to court, and, uh, but taking them to court was like a drawn out process. We, were st we started to do things with, uh, we had to organize about the housing, about education, but we kept it, we kept the, the activity with the lawsuits alive. And two years later, uh, five of the 10 officers were guilty, found guilty of police brutality, and they were, they were let go. And as a matter of fact, the other five were let go as well. And uh, but they, 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 the five were received pay, the other five were just fired. That was, uh, that was, uh, and also during that year, 1968, the, um, the Democratic Party had the National Convention in Chicago, and there was some, oh, um, a lot of, AIM actually had not been formed yet, but we were watching all of the guys that were getting together uh, to form AIM, we were watching the events on television, what was happening in, in Chicago. Hubert Humphrey was vice president, and um, there, was, there was another, uh, Walter Mondale uh, also was uh, uh, there, who later became vice president. Uh, but there, there was um, there was a the police or uh, uh, the guys. Uh, there was a trial in Chicago on the Chicago Chicago Seven. There was actually a Chicago Eight that began, but the. the who was it? Bobby. Uh, he would he he would just yelling at the judge. He didn't have any authority. Have they, uh, have have yeah, they they gagged him in court. And uh, and court said, hey, I said we got to get down there. We got to go, go to that court. We got to get down there. And we got down there, but it was already. Uh, it was already over by the time we got, we got down, but uh, Bobby Seale, I mean, they gagged him during the, all during the rest of the proceedings, not the rest, but he was moving around in the chair and tipped over, and finally they just, they, they, they segregated the him, they separated him from this, the other seven, and so it became the Chicago Seven then. Uh, but in reality, it was uh, it was the Chicago Eight that was original. And the judge there was a very racist judge. The, the, the attorney was a man named uh, Bill Kunstler. Uh, he was a civil rights attorney, um, and uh, he showed very clearly the racism that was in the courtroom by this by the by the judge. Now I forgot his name. Uh, but um, but that was that was the, the 60s, late 60s, and uh, it, it, it was. Uh, then they shot and killed Fred Hampton, the Black Panther in Chicago. The, the Chicago police killed him, but standing right behind him, there's a famous picture of, of, of they're looking over Fred Hampton's body, the Chicago police, but standing behind them, they identified them as. They were FBI agents, and the FBI. And it's always been said, no matter who killed, who pulled the trigger, it was the FBI who engineered his death. Um, and 
the same thing with one of our one of our one of our own heroes, Anime Aquash, who was who was killed, um, and she was set up to, by by the FBI. And I never realized how low the FBI would be until the incident at Wounded Knee in 1973. And there was an armed standout between AIM and the FBI and the U.S. Marshals and all their goons. Uh, and, and on our side was AIM and the civil rights organization called Oglala Civil Rights. And the shooting went on for 71 days. 71 days, shooting on both sides. Uh, of course, they had shotguns and 22s from our side, and AR-15s and automatics on this side. And then, they had, then we had to fight the goons. Um, and they were supplied with weapons from the FBI. We, we kept saying that they were, they were getting firepower from somebody who supplied these guys with ammunition? Who supplied them with these high-powered guns? And we suspected the FBI. We even said that, but the FBI and the goons just denied it. And Twenty years later, the, this Glenn Three Star, who was the captain of the goon squad, he said he admitted finally. He said yes. He said we were supplied with heavy weapons from from the FBI and they supplied us with the, with the ammunition. And, and they, killed, they killed over 60, 67 AIM members during that, during that time. So it was, um, it was, you know, it was, it was a time when, when, when blacks and native people, especially blacks and Indians, were standing up and, 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 and they, they, were, they, were, they were saying, Standing up was a big statement. Holding hands was an even bigger statement. And that's what, that's what, and I, when the FBI was at Wounded Knee shooting at us, I call them cowards. And I call them cowards to this day. And I will call them cowards tomorrow. But that's, that's, you know, they, they said, when we were negotiating the end of Wounded Knee, the FBI said, we will never negotiate with a gun pointed at our head. The government, the U.S. government will never negotiate with, gu with guns pointed at their head. And I said, neither will we. I said, well, you guys got that same gun that we have, so, you know, if you guys want to make some deals with this, you know, we can make some deals, but we're, we're not going to surrender, and, and, and we never, we never laid our weapons down when it ended. One of the conditions that the FBI says, well, you got to pile all your weapons together and we're going to be watching you. And uh, well, they already set my bail. My bail was half a million dollars. And there was no way that I was going <laughs> to come up with that kind of money. But uh, I said, they're not going to get our, we had a meeting after we, on, on, on May 7th of 1973, we had a meeting up on the negotiation hill, and then where we said, okay, it's going to end, because we were running low on ammunition, um, and the food was getting scarce, and the Fed were wanting to end it quickly, because the, the schools were getting let out, and the university students were saying, hold on, hold on, we're going to come, we'll be there. And we got messages like that from many universities. But we just, it was, um, two of our guys got killed there. And um, I felt that, um, not out of fear or, 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 or anything else, I felt that uh, I didn't want any more Native people gunned down and killed. I felt, I felt very sad about that. I said maybe we should, we should end it. Um, but it, it, the FBI was there trying to mouth off to us and I said, and we were in parkas. I, I had, this U.S. Marshal 
the day before, he said, uh, or you know, two days before the, the actual laying, laying down of the arms, he had his hands in his pocket, so did I. He says, Dennis, you know I can take you out anytime I want to. And we had an understanding that there would be no weapons up on the on that truce where we were negotiating. And uh, he had his hands in his pocket. And Wayne Colbert, he says, you know I can take you out anytime I want to, Dennis. I said, how do you mean that? And he went, cocked his weapon inside of his, inside of his parka, and clicked it. It's a dirty son of a bitch. Cowards all of them until we when you work all your life for your people and towards the end of your life at the end of the day, you say if you've done good with your deeds, then it's a good day to die. And today we're gonna fight fight these people that come to kill us. And to save our people, it's a good day to die.